Dr. Donald Phillips. And Dr. Phillips, I'm turning the, uh, the conference over to you. Okay. Before we get started, I'll just blow on my coffee before we hit this and share. You'll understand why I did that. I don't know if y'all can see that or not. So that's what I do. <laughs> so first off, I'll, I, this is a traffic incident management, um, their website. And I would tell you, if you have not taken it, go and take it. It's free. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you that you probably want to download the PDF and kind of go along with it. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those online courses where you cannot skip through the stuff because it will give you a little blurb that is part of a slide and it will not go to the next thing until you press advance to the next thing. So just kind of keep that in mind. It takes about four hours to do. So it's not something that's really labor intensive and keep in mind that somebody that is a government services worker wrote the examination at the end. So just kind of keep that in mind. You get three attempts at it. Um, so, yeah, and it doesn't make a lot of sense in some cases. So I'm just going to kind of try to hit the highlights. Now we'll tell you that this is actually not about driving. This is all about accidents on the roadway and what you need to do to keep yourself and others safe. So, Traffic incident management, this came out of what was called SHARP-2, and it's a short focused research programs, and they focused on four areas, safety, reliability, renewal, and capacity. Let me stop for a second. I'm not gonna get through all of this tonight. There is no way. There, there are too many of the little lessons in this, so we're gonna get about half of it done tonight. So, I am going to kind of blow through this pretty quickly. If you have a question or something, please stop me. Okay. Uh, I've got to be sure that I get the chat window open because I usually forget that and I already had. So <clears throat> let me move that off to the side. Okay. So first off, National Unified Goal. You'll hear throughout that this is part of the NUG. National Unified Goal. And there's three things, responder safety, safe and quick clearance, prompt, reliable, interoperable communications. So those are the things that came out of all of this. Now, they're focusing on several disciplines in particular when they're giving this course and they want these people to take this. And frankly, I think it's actually a good idea. Um, communications, emergency management, EMS, fire rescue, law enforcement, Towing and recovery, and you'll see why in just a little bit, transportation, public works, and then others such as DOT and, and other officials. <clears throat> so first thing is, what is a traffic incident? This is directly out of the, the manual for this, okay? An emergency road user occurrence, a natural disaster or other unplanned event that affects or impedes the normal flow of traffic. I am not going to ask you to spit this back at me, okay? So just so that you're aware of that. Um, <clears throat> and so just keep in, and no, it is not on their test either, but it's very clunky wording. Obviously it was committee that came up with it. So uh, just keep that in mind. And Murph, yes, it does take you to some several things, but it is the offline courses. So the reasons, safety for incident responders, safety for the road users, congestion mitigation and commerce. So in other words, keep the traffic moving so that people make money. And from an interagency perspective, it's a cost-effective risk management strategy. So in other words, if I am the director for an EMS agency or chief for a fire department, it makes a lot of sense risk management wise for me to implement something like this because it is a very standardized course. So here's responder exposures. Once again, we're not going to ask you to spit back details like this, but you know, so this is all just in 2015. So it's five years old now. 
but 6.3 million police reported crashes, 32,000 with fatalities, 1.7 million injuries, and 4.5 million with only property damage. <clears throat> but minimizing the exposure time that we as responders is really the main thing. And that's part of the second nug, safe, safe and quick clearance. So we want to try to get the get all these things cleaned out as quickly as possible. This is something that you will probably, well, I know you're gonna hear it in the lecture over and over and over, the D drivers, drugged, drugged, drunk, drugged, drowsy, distracted, or dangerous. And so they point out that if you're using a mobile phone while you're driving, it is the same as driving blindfolded. Uh, I still see people all the time that later on will finally admit to me, yeah, I was, I was reading a text message or I was doing something on my phone. So these are the people that are most likely to run into us. We have to think about these people. So this is an average over about five years, I believe it was. So 40 law enforcement officers are struck and killed in traffic incidents four fire and rescue personnel, and that includes EMS. But look at that number for towing people, 40 to 60 a year. And then smattering of people from DOT, public works, and the safety patrols. So this is, it's a big problem. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but believe me, if it's your family that's mourning you, that's a lot to them. So we want to try to keep us all safe. <clears throat> this one you will see. Secondary crashes, these are crashes that occur with either within the incident scene, the queue, and we'll define that in just a little bit, or in traffic coming the opposite direction. So you have to think about all of these different areas. Now, I thought that this was interesting. When you look at, look at this pie graph here, you can see that 40% of it is bottlenecks. Those by definition happen pretty much every day or every work day. <clears throat> so those are due to, you know, poor design and interchanges, those sort of things. Um, but then the rest of them are due to non-recurring things. So, you know, things such as, you know, Cowboys game, Rangers game, uh, bad weather, uh, work zones or traffic incidents. And improving that response can help with congestion. reading some of the chats here for a second. Sorry, there's a side discussion going about classes online and stuff, so we're okay. Yeah. For, for this particular one, I had no problems accessing and it uses a flash player as well for all these things. I, I really love this host that's on the slides here. <clears throat> and then this this slide here is and nobody's going to ask you the numbers but points out the cost so the total cost per person um, is about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per person that's for the crash if it's just congestion it's anywhere from 430 to 590 dollars per person so you know it does have an impact on the economy so Here's something that actually, when you take their exam, you may end up seeing some of this in, some, in one of the questions. So a plan coordinated multidisciplinary process, to, yeah, it's a committee that wrote this obviously, um, but the bottom line is they want it to be something that's coordinated yeah, that's, with all the different people and me, it's there to help to detect and clear traffic incidents as quickly as possible. Um, uh, and then, and I know we haven't talked about this. I know I have been on the roster. Somebody's today, got their mic on. Uh, if I did anything on that particular roster, all I did today that was even close to like heavy was I added another column past the notes section. It's Jane's microphone. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> so, <clears throat> anyway, the main purpose is to detect respond to and clear the incidents as quickly and safely as possible. Now, you heard Jane and I talking about rural stuff. 
And I know that I have responded to some places where, frankly, the police didn't even get there by the time we got done with the patient, we're ready to leave the scene. So obviously there's longer response times. A lot of the places, the speed may be a lot higher. I know when I was working in Graham, Texas, there's a lot of the road there between Mineral Wells and Graham, but the speed limit is 70 and 75 miles an hour. And the lanes may be narrowed. There's a lot of places where they don't have shoulders. Um, and there's usually nothing to slow people down, no stop signs, stop lights, those sort of things. And so the other part of that is your ability to be able to detour around the stuff is extremely limited. You may be adding five to 10 miles onto somebody's route by having them detour. Now, this, you'll see some of the stuff in some of the examination, but the, the really important thing to kind of point out is you see that that bar at the top starts out as green, then the incident occurs and it turns red. And as you move further along, that's telling you that the congestion is easing and the traffic is starting to move again. And then back to green is when everything is, is finally terminated. Um, but the, the real goal is to reduce that total duration. And the performance measures that, that they look at, and I have yet to hear this, anything that with my agencies that they've asked us to comment on, but roadway clearance time and the incident clearance time. So there's a couple of different things that, that are measured. And these are things that you know, we probably should be aware of so that we can try to help with that. Now, <clears throat> they really in the lecture, they spent a lot of time on the pit stop analogy. And really the main thing about it is that you have multiple people doing their job simultaneously. And so that's really the take home from that particular slide and that particular point but they do emphasize it over and over. But the main thing that they're wanting to get you to understand is <clears throat> when you're working on one of these scenes, as much as possible, you need to try to everyone their job at the same time, interfering with each other, but with the goal of getting things back to normal as quickly as possible. So, the, the biggest problem is also these secondary crashes, and sometimes that involves hitting us. So that's really one of the big things that they are emphasizing with this, and we're gonna spend a lot of time at the end of this, this hour talking about that as well. Move over laws. Now this, this is something that you're going to see in their final examination, um, but every state has move over laws but they're not uniform. Some of them will require that you also slow down. Some will require that you change lanes or slow down. Some will be both. Driver removal laws. So this is basically you had a fender bender, your car is still drivable, get off the road. Get yourself out of danger before you get somebody else hurt. And so that's really the big thing. The problem is not every state has them. And even in the states that do, the drivers are, are hesitant to move until the police get there. We have this in Texas and <clears throat> two lane road that I drive on all the time was backed up for about a mile because there was a minor accident and everyone was afraid to move their vehicle. So <clears throat> just keep that in mind that, that and check in wherever you live to see if there is a driver removal law. The, the last one is this authority removal laws. So this basically gives legal authority to the responders to remove those vehicles and stuff, but sometimes it's just specific to law enforcement. So that you probably need to talk to the local law enforcement about that to see if that's a law that's in place as well. <clears throat> so you're going to hear MUTCD over and over and over. And basically you need to know that every state either has their own version of TCD or they use them, the national TCD, that's hard to say over and over, and their own supplement. So the map there tells you where it is. I'm in Texas. 
we have our own MUTCD, but if you go across the state line to New Mexico, they've adopted the national one. If you go up to Oklahoma, they have a state supplement along with the national. So, you know, it's not really that important that you know this, just know that for the most part, it is pretty uniform across the country. But this one is one where they have adopted a lot of the same standards as the, the NFPA and specifically in 1091. So, you know, these are the things that especially affect the fire service, but it's a resource for everyone. Now, terminology. This is something that, frankly, you should come back and look at this and take some notes on it. It's pretty intuitive. You know, the, all these terminologies, southbound lane, northbound, you have the median, you have the left lane, right lane, left shoulder, right shoulder. But then when you start getting into multiple lanes, that's where it can get confusing. You have the left shoulder, the inside shoulder, the right shoulder, the outside then lanes one, two, three, and four. Just remember that it is always easier if you number the lanes and it's from the left lane to the right. That's really the easiest thing. And this will come up over and over. And especially if you're the first on and you're trying to call in a report of what's called a windshield survey. <clears throat> now, in some areas you have managed traffic lanes, whether that's a toll lane or an HOV lane. So these are, are specifically separated out as the managed lane. So that would be a toll road or an HOV lane. And then you have general purpose lanes. And once again, they're numbered the same way. That picture on the left, you see that there are two toll, toll lanes there. So they would be numbered number one for the left lane, number two for the right lane, but specifically the managed lanes. And then you have the, the other side over there with the one, two, three, four in the general purpose lanes. So let's stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions up to this point. I know I'm flying through this stuff, got a lot of stuff to get through. Okay, further terminology, upstream and downstream. So think of it as a river flowing. So the, the traffic that is coming towards you is the upstream traffic, the traffic going away from you is the downstream traffic. And then they define the queue as being all the traffic that is backed up and, and essentially stopped. And you need to try to estimate that, that distance. We'll come to that again in a second. So notification and verification. So these usually take place at the same time. This is somebody calling into the 911 dispatch or you calling into your own dispatch if you're the one that comes onto a scene before it's been notified. But they want to know the type and severity, the physical location as best you can get exact, the number of vehicles involved. And this is really important, the color and the type. So, you know, a blue Chevy. You know, a blue Chevy pickup, a blue Chevy car, something to that effect. What lanes are affected? And then if there's injury. And usually, especially if they're using MPDS or the, the law enforcement equivalent or the fire equivalent, they're going to get those questions automatically if, if it's a caller into 911. <clears throat> so this is one of those things where you're, there is a question on the final exam about, okay? the immediate arrival report. So the main thing is you wanna confirm that you're at the right location, okay? Now they talk about especially this windshield size up, which is basically you telling what you can see out of the windshield. But that confirm location, preliminary analysis, and then try to tell what all you need, what resources are required, and if there's any safety situations that are unique those need to be communicated during that, that immediate arrival report. Remember that term, windshield size up is nice, but remember immediate arrival report. So <clears throat> the other part of this is that's just a tip of the iceberg, especially if you're in a command position during one of these incidents. Yes, you get the initial size up report, 
then in about 15 minutes, there needs to be another report to dispatch so that they understand how things are progressing. And then at regular intervals along the way, try to let them know when things are changing that are significant. They especially want to know these four areas on scene safety. Is it dangerous? Is there limited visibility, especially going around a curb on a rural area? Is there hazardous materials involved? The traffic, how long is the queue? How far backed up is traffic? Is there a need to have somebody come in to do traffic control specifically? Do you need to try to set up a deter, especially in the case of a fatality accident? They're gonna be there for a long time. How many are injured? How bad are they injured? Do you need extrication capabilities? Not every engine has the capability to do that. Sometimes they need extra heavy equipment for that. Then do you need towing and recovery? Do you need helicopter EMS, crash investigation? Do you need the medical examiner? So these are the, the four areas that when you start doing those next, not necessarily the windshield size up, but the next ones that those areas need to be covered. So, and this is also not necessarily on their examination, but I think that this is actually a nice little way for you to think about some of these things. How long is it going to take to get traffic back to normal? Less than 30 minutes, that's minor. 30 minutes to two hours is an immediate problem. Two hours or more, that's a major problem. And so if you start thinking about these things when you pull up, that helps because maybe they can start to deter traffic around you if you're going to be there for a while. Once again, we're talking about the time and the amount of the exposure to, to hazardous situations for everyone involved. Now, they spent not enough time on this, in my opinion. To me, this is probably one of the most important parts of this entire course. So I'll end up covering it a little more than they did, but this is a real world sort of thing. This is where when you pull up on a scene, you really need to know exactly how to do this in the right way. So the first question is, can we move it or do we work it here? So if the cars can be moved, get them out of the roadway, get you out of the roadway, get everyone and everything out of, out of the hazardous situation. But there's gonna be times that you cannot move it. Um, Wife and I were going to Fort Worth for something a couple of months ago, and we happened to have a car that blew out a tire and spun right in front of us, got hit by another car, and I was the next one. And we managed to stop before we got to her, but there was no way that her car was gonna move anywhere, and it was facing the opposite direction. So I ended up blocking the lane with my car, and we'll come to, there was a problem with that, in a little bit, but um, did the best that we could to keep me and everyone else that was there safe. So just keep in mind that sometimes you're going to have to work it in a traffic situation. So here are some examples of how you can move the car out of the way. Sometimes just brute force and you pushing it, sometimes push bar on a vehicle. And they talk about how there are some agencies that will not allow their personnel to use a push bar. It's there to push. So, you know, if it scratches a car a little bit, so be it. It's a lot better than having somebody get hurt or killed on a scene. So, this, I thought that this was rather interesting. If you have three lanes of travel and you block one lane, you actually cut down the capacity on the roadway by 51%. And that's, even if it's on the shoulder, it reduces it by 17%. So it doesn't make sense, but it has to do with driver distraction. They're making lane changes, they're merging. Some of them are rubberneckers. So there's all these different things that come into play in cutting down that, that volume that can travel that road right then. So another reason why you need to try to get these people out of the out of the traffic so that they're not going to possibly be hit, and especially you. <clears throat> so here is their definition according to the MUTCD. 
protect the responders performing their jobs, protect the road users traveling through the incident, and minimize external, uh, to the extent practical, disruption of the adjacent traffic flow. So you'll want to try to keep stuff moving as best you can, but in a safe way. So blocking the lane. We've all probably done this at some point, but this kind of is why we do things the way that we do. Okay. The one on the left, the parallel, that's obviously a safety patrol. And so they're trying to keep the lanes as open as possible. Now, the next one, though, you have a fire apparatus and it's blocking the lane along with the shoulder. And we'll come to that in a little bit. But just keep in mind that there needs to be some consideration of all of the different factors, including the shoulder, including that you're back of way far enough from the scene so that if your apparatus is hit, it's not going to be pushed into the scene and hurt somebody. So there's, there's a lot that goes into it and it's, there's more science than art to it in my opinion. So here are some examples of parallel and angled blocking position. We'll talk about these in particular in just a little bit. So here's a big one. You got to block the shoulder if you're in that, in that lane next to the shoulder. You just got to because somebody will go around. You can see the tracks through the slush there. And especially on an icy road, you got to do the right thing because they went around and now they're into the buffer zone. So keep that in mind. So I thought that this was interesting, blocking left or blocking right. Now, blocking left for the fire apparatus is usually just that's their whole job. But if there's a fire or something, keep in mind that they're going to have the engineer down there at the control panel. So you need to put him on the, the side away from the traffic so that it protects that person as well. In our instance, with that door into the patient compartment on the right-hand side, we're going to want to block left most of the time so that we don't have to worry about somebody running into the door. So those are, are a few things. We'll get to that in a little more depth as well in a second. So this is over and over. You're going to hear lane plus one blocking. And the reason for this is that it gives you a buffer zone. And so if there is, you can see, especially that bottom left picture on the right hand picture, there's a car fire and they have blocked the, the, I assume that there's another vehicle blocking the shoulder along with the engine there. And with that angled to the right so that they're able to protect the engineer. Um, so these are all some examples of lane plus one. It gives you some working space. It gives you some buffer. And that's what we really need on these scenes. So here is what they would say is preferred vehicle positioning. So upstream, you would have law enforcement, fire, or a DOT vehicle of some sort, safety service patrol, if you have those in your area. And then downstream, you would have the ambulance and the tow truck. So then they, they need to block at least lane plus one, preferably. So now this, you know, I've run into this when I was a field medic. You know, sometimes we're the first on the scene. You know, we were always taught to go past the scene. But if you're the first on, you need to be sure that you're protecting your scene. So you need to use your vehicle to block, once again, preferably lane plus one. And I would say try to protect that passenger compartment door. So you need to... to block to the left if possible. Um, but that way you are able to start doing your job. When other units arrive on scene, then you need to reposition downstream. So order of arrival is one of the big considerations. Current conditions. You can see these are two very different road situations. If you have an incident just around that corner, you need to be sure that you are blocking far enough away from the incident so that the oncoming traffic has room to respond before they get to you. Once again, you got to keep in mind the safety of everyone, including the people driving past you. And 
<clears throat> um, visibility is a big thing. So sometimes it's agency policy that's going to dictate this, but if your agency has a policy that contradicts the safe practices that are taught here, you may want to talk to your chief or your director and say, hey, you know, I took this course, let me give you the PDF, this is what they advise. Let them take the course and you know see if the policy needs to be changed. Now, there may be variables in your area that are different from others. So just keep that in mind. Now, this is what I ended up with when I was on the scene of that accident. So, uh, Will, excellent question, yes. Once again, we're blocking left or right based on the particular use of your, your apparatus at the time. So if your apparatus is, is a fire engine and it's on a shoulder or somewhere where you're not worried about them having to fight a fire or something. So in other words, the engineer is not gonna be over there at the control panel, then it's really more based on the traffic flow and the position of the vehicles. If, however, they are fighting a fire, or in the case of an ambulance, you may need to access from that side door into the patient compartment, then you need to keep that in mind and keep those areas safe. So they need to be on the on the downstream or the yeah, be the downstream side of the traffic that's coming towards that vehicle. But that's an excellent question. Thank you. I guess what I more meant was if the whatever vehicle was to get hit by a different oh, car. Yeah, we're gonna come to like that. okay, sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. We'll we'll come to that in just a second. So the the response to that that I was at in Fort Worth we were in it would be lane three of a four lane highway on west freeway and in that case yeah i'm in my personal car i don't have lights i don't have much to to slow people down and there were people that were going ahead and going around us thankfully there was a the truck that hit them was in lane four so that kind of blocked lane three and lane four automatically but then, of course, when the fire department shows up, they kind of park angled behind me covering both lane three and lane four. And then a police officer was further upstream and had blocked the shoulder as well. So, you know, it was initially we were an island. And so we had people trying to get around on both sides. Thankfully, the, with the truck there, just a little bit further downstream from the, the car that spun, it was able to stop everything in lane four. But those are some things that you need to kind of think about. Even if you stop in your private car, you know, you need to, you need to keep yourself and others safe. So um, then the next one though is a split scene. And I have worked these a couple of times on freeways and usually the safest thing is just to block all the lanes until you can get stuff moved to one side or the other. So just kind of keep that in mind. But once again, you got to keep yourself and everyone else on the scene safe. And once again, the drivers as well. So here's where you were, where you were going with that, Will. So critical wheel angle. So what they're talking about is that you want to turn the wheels of the vehicle away from the incident. So that way it's not pushed directly into the scene. It will want to turn away from the scene in that particular case. Uh, if you're a small passenger car and you hit that engine, it ain't gonna move much. But if you happen to be driving a truck of some sort, more than a pickup, it's gonna push that engine. So you need to keep that in mind. Now, throughout this course, they have videos from dash cams and things where one of them where an engine is hit by an 18 wheeler. Um, so, you know, you can see how, yeah, even those big fire engines can be pushed all over the place. So scene safety. Uh, we kind of heard all this stuff when we went through driver's ed in high school, but you know, if you think about it at 60 miles an hour, vehicle travels 88 feet every second and the reaction distance is 132 feet. 
So your total stopping distance from the time that it, you know, I don't know if you did this in your driver's ed, but ours, they had a starter's pistol and they said, when you hear the gunfire slam on the brakes, and then it also did another one. So it marked the road both times where the gun was fired and then where you hit the brakes. And they showed you that distance to show you the reaction time. And so the total stopping distance, if you're going 60 miles an hour, is 359 feet. That's a football field. But regular low beam headlights will only illuminate, illuminate about 160 feet. So in other words, you're driving 60 miles an hour. It takes a football field to stop, but you can only see 50 feet in, or 50 yards ahead of you. So that's why you need to have that distance for people to see. You need the lights and all the stuff to, to help so that you're not in danger. So they cover some of the, the markings, conspicuity. There's one of those words that I heard of, but never really heard it used, conspicuity. And they used it over and over and over in their lectures. But it's making yourself so you're obvious is the way that I like to think of it. Now, this, <clears throat> for many agencies, is not dated. In fact, it's NFPA standards that actually started mandating this. And now it's also mandated for ambulances as well. But they've even taken it further and have it on the inside of the doors. And now it's starting to show up on police vehicles and other safety vehicles that show up on our scenes. So this is all in an effort to try to get people to see us before they get to us, preferably when they're more than a football field away. Emergency lighting. I, I know I've been on scenes where I'm like, somebody needs to turn something off because I can't make heads or tails. And so keep in mind that early on when the first units are arriving, everyone needs to leave their lights on. But as you get more and more responders there, somebody needs to turn off some lights. Not everyone, but you need to, you need to turn off the appropriate amount so that you can still do your job on scene so it's not confusing because of that and so it's not blinding oncoming drivers. And they also point out that on most vehicles, especially police vehicles, they're able to turn off the forward facing lights and still have the, the back facing lights on so that people can see as they're coming up to it, especially on a freeway. Not worried about come, somebody coming from ahead and hitting you. You're worried about them hitting you from behind. So just kind of keep those things in mind. And then here's the call it some policy guidance. So they're recommending that everyone should review their, their agency's policy about the use of emergency lights. And so when you need to have them on, when you need to turn them off, those sort of things. And they even cite a section of the MUTCD. Obviously, in states that have their own, like Texas, you'll need to find the appropriate place in, in the state MUTCD. But keep in mind that there is some, some information out there. And so if your agency does not have a policy about it, I'm pretty sure they do it this, you know, 2021, they should have a policy about it. But if for some reason they don't, it needs to be in there and, and bring it to your manager and tell them, you know, here's something that we need to look at. So here's, here's another one. When I started doing EMS medical direction, they were like, and here's your safety vest. And I'm like, my what? And I said, you have to wear it. If you're, if you're on a scene, if you're on a street, if you're on a road, you know, other than responding to a house of some sort, you got to wear this. And I'm like, since when? And they're like, long time. Well, I've been out of actual field response from 1989 until around 2000. So, you know, a lot had changed during that time. Um, the important part of this is that there are standards. There's four classes of, of appropriate visibility apparel. Class one is not to be used by responders at all. And then the fourth class, which is class E, is basically pants that go with a vest. So that altogether becomes a class two or three. So 
here's an example of a class two vest. And so this is appropriate. And then here is a graph. You're not going to have to reproduce this, this chart of, in any way, um, either on their test or on, on mine. But just keep in mind that there are some standards out there. And so what you want is you want to be sure that whatever you're issued is a type P and it needs to be class two or three. These also have a life cycle to them. And so it will tell you on the label that it can be, you know, how it has to be washed when it gets dirty and how many times it can be washed. And once you get to that number of times that it's been washed, then it needs to be replaced. Now this you're going to see again, and that is there is an, an exception to being on a roadway and having to wear a vest, and that is a traffic stop. So if you're a police officer and you're involved in a traffic stop, they don't have to put on the vest, but they really should approach the vehicle from the shoulder side. The other place is firefighters. If they're in an area where they're exposed to flame, fire, heat, and or hazardous materials, they do not need to wear the vest. In fact, it's a hindrance at that point. Now, this actually is one of those things where, you know, you would probably need to school each other more and be sure that we're doing this because, frankly, I don't do it as well as I should. But these are the steps to getting out of an emergency vehicle. Put on the vest, look in the mirror for traffic, look back out the window and check for traffic, open the door a little bit, and then just as much as you need to get out and then close it and get to the safe area. Now, specifically, they want you out of what's called the buffer zone. And the buffer zone is gonna show up on the exams as well, okay? But the really important part about this, practically, you see the, the firefighter there at the front of the engine peeking around the front. He's in an area there, you can see how close the cone is. So traffic is going to be whizzing past him, perhaps, right by those cones. So you need to be sure that you're not going to step in front of traffic. You need to look first. And once again, a good way is lane plus one. So always try to block two lanes if you can. And some general considerations, <clears throat> wear a seatbelt. One of the biggest reasons why law enforcement officers are killed in line of duty in car accidents is they're not wearing a seatbelt. So never trust traffic in either direction. Never turn your back on the approaching traffic and keep awareness, keep your head on a swivel Keep thinking where you can get out. There are numerous videos in their presentation where you see cars that either hit a police officer or the police officer narrowly escapes. Keep in mind, if somebody passes and they're going to hit me, how can I get out? So you need to think about those things. Um, never stand between vehicles. So never, if, if you're parked and you're the, the first on unit, Try not to stand between your unit and the, the first vehicle that you come to. And try to tell other people to get out of the way. Get over to the shoulder, get out of the traffic, get onto the grass. Keep that in mind. So we covered a lot, 48 minutes. We've covered probably, I know that it's right at half of that course as far as the PDF goes. So there's almost 300 pages to their PDF. So we, we covered what I think is probably the important parts of that for EMS especially, but for, for anything as well, you know, for, for others. So let's see what questions you have, because I know it ain't that clear. Zach? Uh, are you there? Let's start with you since nobody's jumping on board here. You can unmute your microphones and talk, or if you don't have a microphone, you can click in the chat yeah. box. Zach says, any specific considerations for women? 
Well, they don't necessarily split those out, but obviously in when you think about rain or you think about ice and snow, you, they're going to have to have further time to stop. So you got to try to try to get people to slow down before they get to the scene. And there are a lot of videos in this course where it's on ice and snow and people are, are there's a very dramatic one out of Dayton, Ohio, <clears throat> where the the police officer's dash cam is actually in the oncoming lane of a divided highway where there's an overturned vehicle. And then the fire engine is on that same side as well. But of course the incident is across the median and the median looks like it's probably three feet tall. And then another vehicle loses control and rolls onto the side and slams into the scene and nobody got hurt there. But then another vehicle slid and hit the pickup that had turned onto its side and it hit a firefighter and threw him 20 feet towards the cruiser. You can see the whole thing. So, you know, just keep in mind that those are particularly nasty times to have something like this. And in those cases, you do need to use common sense and say, okay, you know, I need more help for blocking. I need more buffer space. And we're going to get into all the buffer space and those sort of things coming up. Um, recommendations for implementing policies with an agency. Um, you know, I think that probably the biggest thing, Murph, is see if you can get them to take this course. Because first off, they're going to see that First off, it's nationally recognized and it's free. So it's easy to say, we probably should have everybody in our agency take this course if they haven't. So that way everyone is on the same page. I'm having, I'm having all my people at Life Care and, and at Shackleford County, they're gonna take this course. I'm gonna give them the same lectures that I'm giving to you guys, but then I'm gonna have them take this course as well. I'm gonna recommend that if the first responder agencies have not taken it, that they require their people to take it as well. I think that by doing that, you introduce uniformity so that everyone understands the terminology when they say I'm coming up and, I, and the accident is in lane three. So I'm gonna go ahead and block lane three and four here. You know, and you know, it just makes for a smoother transition to everything. You doc? So, yeah. If I can kind of maybe help address that as well. So sure. um, I'm, I'm full-time law enforcement, included four years as a state trooper in the highway patrol. So basically full-time crash investigation. Um, spent from a, from a management perspective, I'd spent a lot of time um, in depositions um, regarding crashes. And when it would come to um, secondary incidents in particular, uh, attorneys would would look a lot, very hard at what sort of traffic incident management was in place. Um, and if there are best practices out there and standards out there and agencies aren't conforming to those standards, um, it became very difficult uh, for those agencies to really defend, defend themselves uh, in litigation. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. That's, you know, that's touched on later on in the course, but you know, to hear it firsthand from somebody, you know, that, and absolutely. So, you know, if you, and if, so if you took that to your manager and said, you know, here's, this is the national standard. This is from national DOT. This is from the state. Everyone is, is using this. It's an indefensible position at that point, really. What else? Let's see, going through the list. Stuart Alpert, we haven't heard from you. Oh, here I am. There you um, are. Hi there. Uh, so I was on scene um, with search and rescue in San Benito County uh, when an officer uh, who was directing traffic uh, got hit by a distracted driver. Um, unfortunately, uh, many of the two lane mountain highways are not conducive to doing any kind of blocking whatsoever. So we had shoulder only and, uh, uh, he took out, uh, an officer and a Jeep, um, kind of an ugly scene. Not sure yeah. how we could have done it differently though. 
Well, actually, I'll tell you exactly how the Tim course would recommend. You shut down the road. Both, both ways, shut down the road. Because it's not safe to have people, especially if the visibility is, is bad or if it's an area where there's a lot of trees. And so once again, it's a visibility issue or there's a turn or it's downhills. You know, so, so there are a lot of, of personnel that would say, you just simply shut down the road. You cannot risk everyone else. I mean, the person that hit them was also at risk because they run into another vehicle as well. So the safest thing, if, if you're on a two lane road and it's not confined to the shoulder is you stop everything. I mean, they would never hesitate to stop the traffic if you were landing a helicopter there. They're gonna shut everything down. So why should we not get that same consideration as a helicopter would? Because frankly, you're more valuable than the helicopter. Yeah, understand, understand. Thank you. No problem. Excellent. Marla, so, how about you? We haven't heard from you. Oh, sorry, Dr. Phillips. Well, no, I see Denya here. Uh, oh. How far do you place the ambulance? Is there a national standard? Ah. Well, that's actually coming up in the next lesson. So, because they're, they're going to talk about how far out you need to have your buffer zone. And it's also somewhat variable. And I would tell you, once again, it depends on, you know, is there a curb in the road? Is there, are there trees that make it difficult to see for whatever reason? Is there a hill? Is it just over the crest of a hill? So there are a lot of things about this that are scene specific. And so I would tell you that there's not really, they're going to tell you that, you know, it needs to be at least this far away. And for instance, I had no clue, but if you go from, from the front end of one of the stripes on a, on a highway, a standardized highway, to the front end of the next one, it's supposed to be 40 feet. I had no idea. But they tell you to use things like that so that you know how far out you're measuring. Um, so, you know, there, there are some little tips in there that they're going to teach us in the next lesson. Excellent. Bradley, haven't heard from you. Yes, ma'am. I do have one question. Um, sure. Kind of the situation where, you know, if you're on a two lane, you know, small backwoods country road and you have a wreck, um, if you only, you know, if you respond and it's, you're the first person there, how would you recommend blocking off the scene? I mean, like, I'm sure you could block <clears throat> off like the southbound, but I mean, on the opposite side, what do you, what would you recommend to do? Well, you know, if, if you're the only one that's there, then you're going to have to try to decide where is most of the traffic going to be coming from. Most of the time you're seeing is not going to be dead center on both lanes. It's going to be one lane or the other or the shoulder and part of a lane. So I would say that you need to be on the upstream side for that particular lane, whatever that lane is. And then you want to position yourself so that you're, you're, you're blocking the left. That way your passenger's door into the, into the patient compartment is protected. So that, and once again, we usually sit on that same side when we're on the, the squad bench. So that's the other reason to protect that side of the cabin. But I would say that that's probably going to be the most logical situation is that if it's, if it's let's just say that you approach from what would be downstream so it would be on the oncoming traffic for you, then I would say you need to go past the scene and then you, you're going to need to actually turn and then bank it back to the right and maybe even back up a little bit. So, yeah, but excellent question. And unfortunately, there's not going to be a consistent way to say this is the absolute standard. It's going to have to be based on your best judgment and experience. <clears throat> so, yes, Marla, I agree completely, especially when there's snow, the, the flashing can be extremely bad. I, I lived in Columbus, Ohio for three years, and then I was eight years in the St. Louis area. And so, you know, the, the flashing lights alone can be enough to cause somebody to lose control. Um, so, 
as much as possible, yeah, you have to you have to have visibility so that people know that you're there. They know that there's a working scene, but you do need to minimize that. And keep in mind that you know snow and ice will actually magnify your lighting because of that. But that's an excellent point. Thank you. I have something to add here, and uh, you know it popped into my head as I was listening to some of the comments, especially by Chris Weimer. And the, the question that Murph asked earlier about getting buy-in uh, for the operations directors for policies and stuff. And then you talking about also, you know, uh, trying to spread that out to the first responders. I'm sure uh, Chris would agree, uh, Weimer, that um, once you get this buy-in and you start working toward getting your personnel trained in your department and your policies written, that it's really important for your EMS operations director to reach out to your local law enforcement agencies. They need to be aware of how you are being trained. You know, they may need the same course. This course is designed for them too, but even in large departments where all of these things are addressed, it's important for them to understand how you're being trained so that you're all on the same page when you're out here trying to decide how to block these scenes, how to secure everything, because law enforcement is ultimately going to be the ones that are stepping in and taking control of the outside of that scene and controlling everything. And they need to know what you know. Okay. Uh, so, so just real quick, Chris, stay on. Yes. Do you recall back in early 2000 or it may have been, yeah, I think it was early 2000s in the St. Louis area, a fire captain gets arrested on the scene by a state trooper because he will not move his vehicle where the trooper wants him to be. And the, the engine and the captain were in the right. They were in the wrong. I mean, there, there was culpability on both sides, but I don't know if anybody remembers that they cover that particular case in this course as well. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a, a few of those instances. Um, to your point. So the, this course is also mandated for law enforcement uh, in the state of Texas, at least, um, through our, our licensing agency. So, uh, no, you're absolutely right. There needs to be consistency with um, training a across the board. Um, you will see that, um, you know, law enforcement is going to have, uh, at times, uh, depending on the agency and their training uh, in particular, um, they're going to have some competing um, uh, perspectives and priorities. And typically, that's to open up the, the roadway. Um, exactly. You had mentioned uh, the other consideration being the investigation itself, which actually um, we may want to leave roadways closed longer, just depending on on the circumstances. Um, one of the interesting things you had mentioned about keeping dispatch appraised of you know how long we think this incident is going to last and roadways are going to be shut. Uh, that information actually gets funneled up um, on major incidents to the state level. Uh, to really, really high levels because of the c commerce impacts. Um, right. So uh, we, we do get some pressure on keeping uh, lanes open as much as possible, keeping roadways open as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, I, I think this course goes into even, um, you know, have tow truck drivers and having them trained similarly. So, yes, um, yes it does need to be a, a cohesive um, effort. And, and ideally, everybody's getting the same or similar training. Does anybody know if you, fire Chris. departments are, are telling their people that they have to do this or any fire academies training this? T TCFP also does require um, the TIM course okay. to maintain um, the, the career license or the career certification. Okay. So probably the place where it's missed the most is out in the rural areas with the volunteers, I would imagine. Yes, sir. And that's going to be across the board, fire, EMS, and, and law enforcement, your smaller agencies. Right. That's one of the reasons why we're incorporating this in our, our programs now. Uh, EMT level is mandatory. And then we had discussed in our advisory council about whether to make each level take it again and again but we decided it would be much more beneficial to have like what Dr. Phillips is doing for us tonight to help tie it all together in a different format or else you find people glossing through it 
like they do so much of the rest of the EMS operations section and then falling on their face later because they didn't really review it. So I, this is excellent. And I assume you're going to finish part two of this when you come back on the, let's see, when are you back? The 30th? Which uh, night are you back? Next week sometime. The 28th, sometime. January the 28th. Yeah. So. I have to look at a awful. calendar. <laughs> yeah, I, I just did. And January 28th will be when you're doing the second part of this. And yes. This is excellent. Anybody Any else have questions? anything for Dr. Phillips? Chris could probably teach it better than me. Well, his insight tonight has been wonderful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll plan on being back next week. All right. Excellent. All right. We also have one more MD roundtable tomorrow night with Dr. Eschelbach, and I have no clue what his topic is. But if any <laughs> of you guys need more roundtables, you've got two more this month. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, and thank you all. I hope you had a good time tonight, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Have a good night. Stay safe. Thank you both. Thank you. As well.